This is the first in a series of lectures called Toxical Kinetics. At the end of this lecture series on Toxical Kinetics, we will expect you to be able to describe the modes and routes of absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination of toxicants using relevant examples. We will expect you to be able to describe the physical, chemical and biological factors that affect absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination for toxicants using relevant examples and finally to be able to apply this information to your own pet toxicants. To begin with, it is important to explain what toxicokinetics is. Toxicokinetics is how the body processes xenobiotics or foreign particles or material that are potentially dangerous or toxic. Toxicokinetics involves the alteration of blood concentrations and storage sites of foreign substances. These are largely determined by the processes of absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination, or ADME for short. In non-technical language, the questions we will be asking of each toxicant is how does it get into the body? Where does it go when it is in? Once it is in, is it stable or does it change? And what changes it and where? And finally, how does it get out of the body? Firstly, what is absorption? Absorption involves the passage of material across a membrane, in this case a cell membrane. Biological membranes differ in their composition in terms of the types of lipids and proteins, the ratio of protein and lipid, the lipid composition like the amount of uh, cholesterol or phospholip phospholipid present. The diagram on the right shows a typical cell membrane with the classical phospholipid bilayer at the interface of the cytosol and the exterior of the cell. Included in this bilayer are numerous integral proteins, glycoproteins, glycolipids, peripheral proteins and sugars that are involved in various cell processes as well as cell-to-cell -cell communication. Chemicals cross membranes by a couple of different processes including passive diffusion, active transport and endocytosis. Passage through membranes depends on the physical chemical properties of the molecules, such as its size, its shape, its lipid solubility or hydrophobicity, its structural similarity to endogenous molecules, as well as its charge and polarity. Most toxicants will cross membranes, biological membranes, by passive diffusion. Hydrophobic molecules diffuse across the lipid domain of membranes. The majority of toxicants are larger organic molecules of differing lipid solubility. The diagram on the right shows four different scenarios with chemicals of different sizes and polarities. The first instance shows where a small lipophilic chemical, um, and as, as is indicated by the arrow, it is able to cross the membrane easily. When it's a small hydrophilic chemical, it is not able to cross uh, as it is not lipophilic enough. Same is true for small ionized chemicals. For large lipophilic mo uh, compounds, a smaller amount of the molecule can cross when compared to small lipophilic molecules. So the ideal for crossing would be that it would be small in size and lipophilic in nature. <coughs> Uncharged molecules diffuse passively across membranes, but many chemicals are weak acids and weak bases. The pH of the fluid a chemical finds itself in can affect its charge. The behaviour of molecules at biological membranes can be quantified and defined by equations, most notably the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation shown at the bottom of the slide. This is important as the movement of molecules can vary throughout the body. As is indicated in the diagram on the right, there is variation in pH in different regions of the body, from a pH of 1 in the stomach to a pH, pH as high as 8 in the lower colon. We can consider what will happen a, what will happen, what'll happen chemicals in these environments. For weak acids, for example, they usually dissociate in solution to give the A-, minus, which is the A for acid, and H+, plus, which is representative of the proton. Um, and we can quantify its dissociation constant by multiplying the concentrations of both ions, um, the A- minus and the H plus ion, divided by the concentration of the undis undissociated or uncharged form, the AH. By getting the log of each of these sides, 
we end up with a minus the log of the Ka equals minus the log of the H plus concentration minus the log of the A minus ion divided by the AH uh, uh, concentration. And as we know, the pH is defined as the minus the log of the H plus concentration, and the pKa is defined as minus the log of the Ka. So rearranging this equation gives a new form, um, and we can rewrite it as pH equals pKa plus the log of the A minus concentration divided by the AH concentration. This is now in the form of the equation at the bottom of the slide. Um, we can also carry out a similar exercise for weak bases. Both of these equations allow us to take into consideration the pH of the fluid in which the chemical finds itself in, its own pKa, and therefore it allows us to determine the concentration of the chemical in the uncharged form. If we look at this for specific examples, such as aniline on the left and benzoic acid on the right, we can see how the pH of the environment can influence the extent to which a drug is ionised, and therefore the extent of diffusion across the membrane. In each case, it looks at the molecule in three, at three different pHs. The first is in the stomach, the second is in the blood, and finally the third is in the intestine. For a weak base, it is poorly absorbed in the stomach and therefore very little passes into the circulating blood supply around the stomach. This is because the ionized form is the predominant species here and the dissociation equation is, dis is driven to the left by the large amount of H plus ions that are available in the acidic environment in the stomach. When the pH increases, the H plus concentration decreases and therefore the equilibrium equation is driven to the right and so the uncharged species is more predominant and therefore more of this molecule gets absorbed uh, more readily in the intestine. The opposite is true for weak acids where weak acids are absorbed very well in the stomach where there is an excess of H plus ions and the equation is driven to the left and therefore to the uncharged species. However, in the intestine, where there are fewer H plus ions at higher pH, the equilibrium is moved to the right and the charged species, which is, which is not absorbed. Another method of transport uh, employed for toxicants is filtration. When water flows in bulk across a porous membrane, any solute small enough to pass through the pores flows with it. This passage is known as filtration. However, many toxic chemicals are too large. An example of a location where filtration is used includes the elimination of toxicants from the kidney. Renal glomeruli allow molecules smaller than that of albumin, so around 60 kilodaltons, to pass through. The channels in most cells, however, are much smaller, permitting passage of molecules with molecular weights of no more than a few hundred daltons. In some cases, methods of active transport are needed to move chemicals across a membrane. This can involve specific membrane carrier systems. It will require specific receptors providing selectivity for the molecule and metabolic energy in the form of ATP, as is shown in the diagram on the right. This will generally move against a concentration gradient and eventually reaches a saturation at high concentrations. When considering potential toxicants, chemicals must be structurally similar to endogenous molecules and such substrates compete with each other for uptake, leading to competitive inhibition in some cases. There are also a number of specific transporters designed to remove potentially toxic molecules. These pump out certain toxicants that manage to gain entry to the cytosol. The diagram on the right shows the active removal of chemotherapy drugs from the cytosol of a cell. Examples include active energy dependent transporters of the large superfamily known as the ATP binding cassette transporters or ABC transporters. Uh, other members of this, this uh, superfamily include the multi-drug resistant or MDR proteins, P-glycoprotein or PGP, um, and both of these uh, exude chemicals out of the cell. Other examples include the multi-drug resistant associated proteins or MRPs, and these are responsible for organic anion efflux and they're also responsible for the transport of glucuronide and glutathione conjugates which we'll come across in the third lecture. 
finally, uh, the breast cancer resistance proteins or BRCPs are responsible for uh, organic anion efflux and some sulfate conjugates, again, which we'll come across in the third lecture. Facilitated diffusion is a carrier-mediated transport where the substrate is not moved against an electrochemical or concentration gradient and does not require energy. Examples include the organic anion transporter peptide or OATP family, which transports acids, bases and neutral compounds and is important in hepatic or liver uptake of xenobiotics or foreign chemicals. Uh, there are other um, transporter families such as the organic anion transporter OAT family and these are responsible for the renal or kidney uptake of anions and the organic cation transporter or OCT family are responsible for kidney and liver uptake of foreign chemicals. Um, other notable transporters include nucleotide transporter family, uh, the divalent metal ion transporter, the peptide transporter <clears throat> and all of these can aid particularly in gastrointestinal absorption of things like nucleotides, metals, di and tripeptides. Um, you may come across these in the searches for your pet toxicant. Some toxicants, including particles and liquids, are taken into cells by endocytosis and more specifically penocytosis for liquids and phagocytosis for solids. This involves the invagination of the cell membrane and requires metabolic en energy and in some cases may even require receptors. The resulting vesicles, as is seen in the diagram, may fuse with primary lysosomes and, and that leads to the di digestion of the particle or liquid. Examples include asbestos particles that can be found at the bottom of the lungs. We will now look at the major locations where toxicants can enter the body and the three main routes are the GI tract, the skin and the lungs. Absorption can take place along the entire GI tract, even in the mouth and rectum. The small intestine has a very large surface area, a good blood supply, and there's a large variation in pH throughout the GI tract, meaning there's plenty of opportunities for molecules to cross membranes. Absorption of lipid soluble and non-ionized molecules can occur throughout the GI tract. Weak acids, um, which are lipid soluble and non-ionized are mostly absorbed in the stomach where the pH is low, around 1 to 3. And for weak bases, as we've already discussed, that are lipid soluble and in the non-ionized form are generally absorbed in the small intestine where the pH is higher, between 6 and 8. Active transport can also aid in the movement of some heavy, heavy metals, including cobalt, which can use the iron transporter, and uh, lead, which can use the calcium transporter. But there's also some examples of endocytosis happening in the GI tract, particularly with certain toxin, toxins uh, like botulinum toxin. Um, simple diffusion, however, is very common and it uh, tends to be proportional to the surface area, the permeability and how long it spends in that particular region uh, known as the residency time. The second location we'll look at is the skin. It has a large surface area, but not highly permeable. It has seven cell layers before it uh, enters into the blood. And as is shown in the diagram, the upper layer is called the epidermis and within that um, sublayer called the stratum corneum. So this is a non-vascularized region, meaning, meaning there's no blood supply at the very, very top. The SC or stratum corneum is the rate determining factor and toxicants must pass through this region by diffusion. The dermis, which is underneath, is more permeable, it's vascularized, meaning it has blood vessels as can be seen from the diagram, and it has multiple cell layers. Absorption in the skin is generally by passive diffusion and involves mainly small lipophilic chemicals. The extent of the absorption varies depending on the site as there are extensive differences between the thickness of the skin in different locations uh, of the body. Um, increased absorption of toxicants occurs if the stratum corneum integrity is broken, so if, if it's cut, for example, um, or if the stratum corneum is hydrated, or, or in cases where there is increased temperature or blood flow at the top of the skin. Um, if the toxicant has a small size and if there's low solubility in the vehicle that it is travelling in. The lungs is often a site of toxicant absorption, particularly gases and particles. 
it has a large surface area and a very good blood supply. In fact, it has it gets over one hundred percent of the cardiac output. It can absorb gases, vapors, um, aerosols, and particles, as shown in the diagram in, the, in at the bottom right. Uh, gas molecules can diffuse from the alveolar space into the blood and then dissolve until the gas molecules in the blood are in equilibrium. Particles can travel also in air that's inhaled and particles of different sizes can settle in different regions of the tract, including the nasopharyngeal region, which tends to have larger particles settle between 5 and 30 microns, the tracheobronchiolar region, which tends to have smaller particles, and the smallest particles tend to settle in the lower down regions of the alveoli. Particular matter may uh, over time travel up the respiratory tract by movement of mucus and cilia and then get swallowed where it goes into the digestive tract. Particles are generally removed by phagocytosis um, by the alveolar macrophages which are immune cells that are present in the lungs. Alternatively, uh, toxicants can still reach the blood supply even if they are not ingested, inhaled or splashed onto the skin. Other routes include the intravenous route and uh, the toxicants will, tra will directly travel uh, to the bloodstream, eliminating absorption. Subcutaneous, or SE, and intramuscular IM injection, as is shown in the diagram, usually results in absorption at slower rates, but they still can enter the general circulation. Intraperitoneal, or IP injections, results in rapid absorption of xenobiotics. Um, IP toxicants, or intra intraperitoneal uh, administered toxicants, are absorbed primarily through the portal circulation and therefore pass through the liver so they can get metabolized. Finally, intrathecal or IT injection involves entry into the cerebral spinal fluid directly as shown in the diagram on the bottom right. So toxicologists are concerned with the levels of toxicant reaching the systemic blood supply. For this we need to know about a toxicant's bioavailability. So bioavailability is a term which means the fraction of the administered dose reaching the systemic circulation unchanged and therefore it's likely to reflect, reflect the concentration at the target site more closely than the actual dose administered because it's the, the concentration that's left after the processes of, ad, of ADME. It may also indicate tissue exposure and expected toxicity in case of overdose. It may indicate, in some cases, accumulation on chronic exposure. The diagram on the right shows the plasma levels of a chemical as time progresses, and this can be analysed mathematically. Analyses are based on measurements of toxicant in the blood or plasma samples taken at timed intervals after administration. We will discuss this later in the series. Finally, we would like you to apply the information learned today to your own pet toxicant that you have chosen. You will need to acquire the following information about your toxicant. Firstly, its route of entry into the body, the site of absorption and its bioavailability, the mode of distribution, its volume of distribution, the metabolism, its major metabolites and enzymes responsible for the metabolism, the route of excretion, and in all cases, we'd like you to supply us with your sources of information. So we have provided you with an, a worked example of this, we've chosen the drug paracetamol and we've provided the information on those different parameters required as well as a source of information from the literature.